Hi, my name is Yomi Shode. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Gloucester Communities in Conversation. And I am thrilled to be a part of this project and I can't wait to really get into the crux of conversation with our panelists. I'm not alone though, I've got someone here, born and bred from Gloucester, and she is my co-host. My name is Michelle McFarlane. I'm a local girl, I'm a freelance hairdresser. I also volunteer, support and work with local Gloucester black owned businesses. Awesome. Um, you might be wondering why we are doing this. Um, for one, I'm from London. I have no idea to the history and to the cultures of Gloucestershire. So it's an absolute privilege and honor to be here, not only via Strike a Light. My play has been here before and the relationship has continued, but now to be sat here amongst this amazing panel, including my co-host joining us in this panel, Today is just this amazing array of bodaciousness and I'm going to start off to my immediate, immediate left with Valerie Sims. Hi Valerie, how are you? Hi Yomi, thank you very much, I'm fine. Um, please, talk to us about you and what you've been doing and the great work that you do. Well, my name's Valerie Sims. I'm born and bred in Gloucester, for my sins I always say that. Um, but my background is in fashion. I also run an organisation called Diverse City and I'm also, also the lead for the, um, the Walk In My Shoe Whims programme. Um, I'm, I'm being here today to um, share a little bit about history and about the background within Gloucester. Like I said, I'm born here and so I know a little bit. Um, also, um, I've, I'm now working with um, Strike A Light. They've commissioned me to do kind of a resident as a residential artist. Um, I'm a single mother. I live in Gloucester itself, and I'm happy to be here to share some more of my loveliness. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Manny Mish, looking way more slick. Manny, how are you? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Um, I'm a college lecturer, I teach maths. And also the weekends I work at BBC Radio Gloucestershire and do a, a community radio show. Um, and also I'm Deputy Lieutenant of Gloucestershire, so the Queen's representative in the county, mm. which I'm very proud to do. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Awesome, thank you very much. Tracy, hello. Hello, <laughs> my, my name is Tracy Thomas. Um, I, like uh, Valerie and uh, Michelle, am born and raised in Gloucester. Uh, I'm a parent, uh, first and foremost. Um, I work, um, work in full time, but recently I've been good to be part of, becoming part of the community, I've been recently appointed as a governor for the Gloucestershire Foundation NHS Trust, which I'm very proud of. So I'm learning to be about what is involved in that and will be able to um, participate in that journey going forward. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me today. Looking forward to participating. Normally we'll be all probably sat closer together, but in our hands, masks, 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 masks. We're social distancing and it's been a heavy 2020. Um, and I'm just very keen in knowing about your, as a, as a little starter, you know, um, in this quite chilly morning, so to speak. Um, your COVID, your COVID lockdown stories, what was that whole experience like in terms of your lockdown? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm very, yeah, I'm very interested in knowing that, especially being that you're, you're part of the community. What happens when you're kind of put in a position where you have to stay inside for like X amount of months? How has it been? Who, who would like to start? Well, I can start. Um... For me, it's been exciting all the time. I'm just excited in life generally. There's no problem because as soon as we went to lockdown, the college shut, we were sent home and we were all given laptops. So we were on Zoom. So we were talking to our colleagues. Mm. And then the first thing we did with our family, with my brothers and sisters all over the country, is to set up these regular quiz, which is a quiz on a uh, wow. Friday night, Saturday night. So it was great. We didn't go out anywhere, mm. but... I, I did so much work on the computer. I, I read about Socrates. I read about Buddha. I, I compared Jesus to what, uh, you know, because I, yeah. I, I'm a Christian. Christian man. So I read a lot about lots of things. So for so me, it, was, it gave me an opportunity actually to learn a lot more. Val? Yeah, me. I, 
it sounds terrible, but I actually enjoyed my lockdown. Mm. One, because I've got a youngest, my youngest daughter, I take her very early to school, mm. um, and it's about eight or 10 miles out, and it was like time out for me. Mm. But also, the same as what Manny said, I kind of, not in the um, Christianity and beliefs and that, but I, I found myself as a person, um, did a lot more research, knew about me, that I'm more interested in the arts, even though I love the arts as well, but I was, it was more deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It was looking about myself and um, identifying what I'm about. And yeah, so I enjoyed it actually. I'm enjoying it still. Whoa, <laughs> free for free, Tracy, how was yours? Mine has been different because yeah. uh, I've been able to work from home. So in that aspect, things haven't changed in that I'm working nine to five. The only thing that's different now is obviously I don't have to commute. Mm. So unfortunately, it seems like I'm working longer because instead of having that, you know, you're getting up and instead of having that half hour to get to work, it's like, well, you might as well just start. And it, you have to have that um, discipline to work all the time and also just to stop and just take some time out for yourself because otherwise you can just become very focused. Yeah. Oh, my business has, been, has not really been impacted that much by COVID, yeah. luckily for us. Um, but the, what, the other thing that's been good about it, the benefit is that I've been able to focus and spend time talking to the family. Awesome. And you know, you're spending time yeah. talking to people because you're making time to talk to people. You've yeah. got, you can't go out. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going for walks, you, you know, and people are much, ki we're much kinder. Yeah. Um, thank you. Michelle, how was yours? How did you find yeah, it? Yeah, um, kind of. In the beginning, it was a huge shock, I suppose, because I worked for myself being self-employed. I suddenly panicked. I thought, oh my gosh, I've worked since I was 14. I've never been unemployed, but it made me feel unemployed. Yeah. And I've never claimed benefits, so I didn't understand the benefit system, what I actually had to do. So going through all that process of um, finding out what kind of um, help I may be entitled to. Um, it, it felt a bit like um, an, an emotional sort of roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was probably one of the negative things. The positive thing, like Tracy said, yes, it gave me the opportunity to spend more time with family, mm. reconnect with old friends. Um, I was making phone calls, speaking to people I haven't spoken to probably in years. Mm. Um, so yeah, and spending more time with my mum and with my mum being elderly and her day centre being closed, my mum's routine and structure has totally changed, so she's still at home. Mm. So as a family, we've had to pull together more and, um, and support one another more, you know? So yeah, yeah. That's, it, it has been negative and positive. And you, how, how have you felt? Um, there was a week I'll never, I'll never forget where just uh, was a straight week of cancellations in regards to shows and gigs and stuff. Um, and it just kept happening every single day, just going. Yeah. There was meant to be an event at the um, Shakespeare Globe that we was gonna produce this year, um, our, our team. And that postponed, when I came in, that was a big hit. It was just like, oh, we was really looking forward to being at the Shakespeare Globe this year. And um, that was just like another thing. I was meant to launch something else. Another thing was just going, it was going, kept on going. So then in comes this whole thought of what, what, what now in terms of trying to survive through the, for the foreseeable, because I just don't know how long this is gonna last for. Um, but then things start to pick up, you know, people start to get in contact in terms of, okay, everything's moving to a more digital setting now, whereas we're not meeting physically no more, we're now moving digitally. Is there a way to kind of adapt shows to bring it to Zoom or to all these different kind of mediums? And things just start to just change from there. And I, like you, Manny, I was just got into the books. There's certain books that I've got in the bookshelf that I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read, but I kind of, I left it because there's more priority in terms of research that I needed to do. But now I'm like, I'm here, I'm just here. So I started picking these books up and started reading them. And that was a lovely process as well and a good time to spend with the family also. So it's been like this for me, yeah. a lot of that going on um, to a point now, even now, I'm just like, this is the new normal of how things are. Sometimes I love these masks and sometimes I can't stand it steaming up my glasses. I can't, I hate it, do you know what I mean? I just, it's just, just jarring. But 
it is just but what we, it is. Yeah, we have to get here. used to the mask. The masks are going to be here for a very long time. A while. Yeah. So I need to find yeah. a way to get used to it, you know? Um, thank you. Uh, I guess my first question generally is a bit of an open one. And it's, um, what is your relationship with Gloucestershire? There's a place called Matson, mm. and that's where I was raised um, when I was little. And um, at, the, at that time, there was mainly um, farms, mm. um, more kind of um, foliage, you know, trees. Well, we're in the country anyway. That's what some of my friends from Birmingham, London, and so on would say, well, your country. But we're in a town, but most, mainly where I was, it was mainly um, more um, natural habitat. Anyway, cut a long story short, that's where I was brought up. So we, um, as we were little, or when junior's time, we would used to go um, apple scromping, I think it was, climbing a few trees, <laughs> doing the boys stuff and getting into a lot of trouble. But it was nice, comfortable trouble. And um, my mum didn't know nothing about that, God rest her soul. But then we journeyed down to the Chequers Bridge, which is near um, to the town centre. And that's when I um, started in secondary school. That's where an eye-opener was for me, because um, up in Matson, you didn't see a lot of black people up there. They were mainly in the town centre. So coming further into town, open to more of an open dialogue, a bit, bit more about where the, the young people hang out in youth clubs and so on. We had our own type of, we kind of, a kind of isolation in a sense, because mm. um, mum was quite strict with um, how to protect us because in those days, um, there was still a little bit of racism around and so she was very overprotective on when we were supposed to go out and when, what time we come in. Mm. But overall, um, born and bred here, still in Gloucester, mm. but journeyed out, I've actually um, made different friends, different cultures. So, right, early doors, Gloucester, mm. apple scrumping, mm -hmm. ventured out a bit more. Yeah identity in terms of like oh mm. this is what's happening yeah growing up other communities joining in manny yourself i was born in india i came here when i was 10 but i came to swindon that's where i grew up and yeah. um i ended up by accident really in uh, gloucester i came to study here back in 1979 i was 22 I came to do HND in math, stats and computing. The thing is, I always had a ready-made family, really, because I was in the Air Cadets. I was, I'd just become an officer, <laughs> uh, a pilot officer in the RAF Cadets. So I straight away joined the Air Cadets, so I met a lot of people. And I used to play table tennis, so I joined a table tennis club. And I used to go to church, went to church. So I was really in a very white, middle-class sort of environment. Uh, then I got to learn more about the Asian culture around Barton Street and all of those people. But I lived on the outskirts, really, along Levens Way, mm. in Gloucester. And, I, and um, when, when I was studying, they just offered me a job. They, they said, well, look, uh, I like, we like the way you explain things. Mm. So we'd like to offer you a job. There's a new, this YTS thing starting. <laughs> You're young, and these are 16, 17-year-olds. I, I was about 24, maybe, at that time. And we'd like to offer you a job as a lecturer in computing, and that's what I did. So, um, in fact, I was one of the very first students in the 70s who did A-level computing when it first came out, A-level computer science. Wow. And um, so, that, that's how it started. So I started speaking like, a bit like the Gloucestershire accent, you know, I got that. <laughs> but now I live in Cheltenham, <laughs> I speak rather well. Uh, I have tea every afternoon at four o'clock, and it's jolly nice. <laughs> so the, there, is, there is this kind of journey in from even from Val's story to yours in terms of, because again, I think even in prior conversations, I, ex I mentioned that I was born in Nigeria and I arrived, arrived in, in Bethnal Green actually, when I was, um, when I was nine and, and meandered to Peckham. Um, and that was pretty much was my, was my youth and growing up. But you've pretty much right from, from India, assimilated predominantly around a white landscape if, if, if just put I think fairly. being a member of the church helped. Yeah. Because you straight away mix in with the community. Right. But then at the, from what you're saying, that community wasn't as diverse, so to speak. No. Like in no. the early, early doors, it was very much like a white landscape. Yes, which you, yeah. Until, you, again, 
kind of found your own wings in terms of the lecturing and he was invited to be a lecturer. Mm. But then even now you're talking about Cheltenham and, and, and even the Gloucestershire accent and what have you, you're still kind of assimilating, but in your own, on your own terms. Yes. Which I think we'll, we'll touch on later on. Um, thank you. Um, Tracy. Well, I was born in, born in Gloucester also, and uh, I remember um, as a little girl, um, we lived in uh, just off Barton Street, and we stayed there till I was about seven, I, I can remember. And so one of my earliest memories is um, walking along, um, holding my dad's hand on the church. Uh, it's no longer a church now, and I'm trying to remember what kind of building it is, but it's right by the, yeah, uh, by um, where Barton Street and Eastgate Street meet, where opposite where that B and Q is, B and Q uh, used oh yeah, to be, yes, where yes, go, yeah. Yeah. Um, where outdoors is. Yes, yes that's mm. it, right there. And so I can remember ho walking past there when I was about four. And th so Gloucester has changed an awful lot in you know in in my lifetime. Um, I lived here until I was uh, eighteen and went away to uni and then came back when gosh, when I was 40, actually. So I have seen a lot of changes in that time. As a young person, when I was um, uh, growing up, it, the black community, we were all, because our parents were all, were, my parents are West Indian or Jamaican, and all, our parents all knew each other because they all came mm. from, were part of the Windrush generation, and they all knew each other, and they were all friends. Mm. So if you did anything, people would say, you all, I always thought my parents knew were just, <laughs> brilliant because they always knew if you were on the bus where you were and I didn't realize it was because of the network <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that they all knew each other I remember one time I uh, <laughs> so went to some some boy's house or I can't even remember his name now but uh, I saw my parents wedding picture there so I was <laughs> just like oh my <laughs> lord it was just like you couldn't you couldn't make yeah, it up that could be family yes <laughs> so it was just so you know it, so it, um, it Gloucester was a very good place to grow up for children because like Val was saying about doing going I remember going strawberry picking yeah. and all that kind of, you know so it was mm. you had mm. the good part of being mm. you know in a town but also you know the you, you were as children you you felt safe yeah, you, definitely. so that was the main mm. thing and then going away and then coming back later when you know bring because I raised my daughter here mm. it was just you could see all the changes how things had progressed how life was different how there were so many different uh, nationalities it was much more multicultural than it was when we were growing up it was it, there have been a lot of changes and a lot of change, some of them a lot of them for the better. Mm. I guess the, the interesting part about your your point and your take is, you know, unlike uh, Manny and Val, and to some degree, I'm not sure, what the community in which the infrastructures that you mentioned, I didn't necessarily get a sense of with, with Manny and Val, not to, and that's not even taken away from their points, but the way that you're talking about, you go into this boy's house, you see your, your parents <laughs> winning picture in the house. <laughs> You're like, what kind I didn't of, even know that they kind of, of <laughs> yeah, what kind of CSI stuff is happening? How do you know that I was on a bus? And what, what's going on? Yeah. But that speaks to a very tight community that that are still keeping in, in communication with each other, from from a point of like the Windrush generation that are still very much like this is how we're protecting each other going forward because we're kind of going into this unknown unknown, and all we do know is ourselves mm -hmm. and our children, and this is how we're going to go forth, right? And that that is interesting. So that I picked that up, and also I picked up the boomerang type thing. You, you left, you come back, yes. And there's something in the coming back and staying within that is important. And I think it leads neatly into the next question, which is around. Um, cool. At what point did you feel that my role in Gloucestershire now is now? This is, all the stuff is happening. I've kind of grown up. I'm grown enough to kind of understand within myself that, okay, it needs me somehow, some way. What do you, do you remember at what point that was that you felt that you had a role to play within Gloucester? Um, I can go from there. It's, um when I was many, many years ago, when I was a little bit slimmer, I used to do a, a, um, African dancing. Mm. And um, there was Benjamin Zephaniah that came down to perform at the Guild Hall. And um, we used to do a little bit of a tour, went to Basingstoke. And this particular event, they had 
um, a few stands and on it was sickle cell and thalassemia. I thought, what's sickle cell and th thalassemia? Um, and I went over to this lady and she said, well, it's, it's all about mainly for black people. I said, well, tell me a bit more. Mm. And I thought, well, I wonder what if Gloucester has um, a kind of a, a community, a few people that has this disorder. This, this and um, came back to Gloucester, made some inquiries, went to the hospital. And I said, well, I think it was Dr. Ruppner. And um, I said, right, what's this about, this sickle cell thing? She said, well, we're only screening young babies here and not adults. I said, well, why are you not screening adults? Because I haven't got any money. I said, well, when I was at school, I had a couple of friends that had, um, they were carry one of them was a carrier for haemophilia. And um, the boys were the, the ones that would, haemophilia is, you know, not able to blood, the cl clotting of the blood. And I said to um, Dr. Rockner, I said, well, if you haven't, if you're not screening adults and um, they're still kind of having a relationship and having babies, that one of them might be a sickle cell tray or what have you, how are you going to ident how, how are you going to then find out who has sickle cell and who has not and the illness will then kind of be more the, an awareness then and so i then decided because of my background is in fashion i would do my first show mm -hmm. to raise some awareness and some money and that's where i realized that gloucester had changed for me in the sense of um not knowing a lot a lot more about um, my own background my own history um, because it was a, a so-called black disorder and it was knowing what the community and, and how the community would receive um, such knowledge of, of sickle cell. And that's one of the major points for me of my change. Awesome. Tracy? Um, mine was very recent, actually. Um, I was down to um, the Black Lives Matter um, uh, conference but it, they had a, a meeting and it was down at uh, Gloucester Park and that was back in March no it was April when I, I can't remember when it was during the summer anyway yeah. and uh, there was a speaker there and she was saying what you can't complain about things not being the way that you want them to be um, if you're not part of the process so it was just like you know what she's got a point everybody's busy everybody's got things going on before that i was always focused on you know working as a single parent making sure that i had it you know taking care of business looking after my daughter and stuff she's older now and it's just like you know what it's time for me to step up and become part of the community and do my bit because if i don't who who else is going to and that was so for me it was a very recent thing a very recent uh, coming forward. Thank you. Um, Manny? The thing is, I, I never really felt out of the community. I've always felt I'm part of it right from the very beginning. But in 1995, uh, I was asked to be on the BBC, BBC Radio Gloucestershire. I got married in 1995. Uh, I became a magistrate in 1995, so that's quite significant, actually. And I had TB in 1995 as well. Mm. So everything happened in 1995 for some reason. And um, but I only became a magistrate because I saw an article in the newspaper and they were saying that um, more African-Caribbean and Asian people were being put in prison than uh, white people comparatively. Now, we're talking about things that were happening 25 years ago mm -hmm. and things don't seem to have changed very much since then as far as that goes. So, so I thought I'll, I'll make a difference. I'll actually contact the, the, the courts and say, look, I'd like to become a magistrate and what's it all about? And uh, so I did, so I, I got selected. And there are a few changes that I made because it's, just to give you one example, uh, one of the magistrates, the chairperson said at one of the times, there was a Bangladeshi guy who'd gone to Bangladesh and he hadn't paid his fine. He'd been charged for something for a, a driving offense. And he hadn't been back for six months and so the fine had got quite high. And uh, they said, well, why, why didn't you actually pay your fine? Why, why haven't you done that? He said, well, I was in Bangladesh for quite a, quite a long time. And she goes, well, if you can jolly well spend that long on holiday, you can pay the full fine. Mm. So I said to her, well, hang on, when we go back to India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, we're not going on holiday. <laughs> Usually, if it's six months, it's very likely it's family issues. We're trying to sort out family things and not necessarily. So on holiday, she could, couldn't understand that. 
that you can afford to stay. And I said, Bangladesh is so cheap. You, you, you know, you can spend a whole day on one pound, mm -hmm. eat and drink and, you know, really have a good life. It's those sort of things that I changed their attitude to think because they're so middle class, not really in with the younger people. I, I was one of the youngest magistrates, actually, at that time. I was in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that's when I realized that there are a lot of people who don't understand Asian culture. They don't understand about the community. There were so many things they didn't understand, really. That changed. There, there was more of an understanding um, of, of cultural backgrounds and how they, what, what they did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you definitely... So, so, yeah, yeah I mean, and the, whoever actually wrote the article in the paper, and I can't remember who it was, it was 25 years ago, they were absolutely right, because the, the, the people I, I came across who were magistrates, often they lived in villages. They didn't even understand the own white community in, in working-class areas. Okay. They, they couldn't understand, in fact, there was one case I remember when this lady was, um, she hadn't paid his, uh, her um, television license. Mm -hmm. And the, the way the law is that you can, you can go to jail if you don't pay your TV license uh, because it's government money, you see. Yeah. So this pregnant lady comes in, it's the third time she hadn't paid her license fee, and they said, well, the only thing we got is really prison for her. And I said, but how can we send her to prison? She couldn't even have enough money to pay, feed her children. But would the magistrates have actually have gone that far as... Some would have done, but we, obviously we didn't send her to prison. But, some, but because sometimes what happens is your hands are tied. The law says, yeah. this is it. Where the magistrate change is how, how much punishment you yeah. can... And how yourself. long that punishment is. Yes. Yeah, the but duration. if the law says, well, you know, if you've gone through a red light, it's three penalty points and £80 fine. Yeah, and but and that's if you is. come to court, we could reduce that. We can't reduce the three penalty points, but we can reduce that to ten pounds fine, yeah. or even increase it to five hundred pounds fine, because the fine can be up to five thousand pounds. Oh, so, um, so, th but that's why we need humans, magistrates, to be able to make that decision, depending on the situation of the individual. Otherwise, it's all computerized, and a computer is not going to distinguish between people. Yeah, and then all cases are individually assessed. That's why you yeah. need magistrates, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's why you need the magistrates. Yeah. 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 Has it changed now? It's, it's, I mean, there are more people from African Caribbean uh, community in, um, as magistrates and Asian community, mm -hmm. and things do change. There are more people from... In fact, I was on the advisory committee, so I was a chairperson, actually, to recruit people. So it's more diverse. Yeah, more diverse yeah. people. Yeah. They can understand the background of the, okay. the, the uh, people who are charged. Um, but we, we do find people not guilty. You know, people are found not guilty. True, yeah. yeah. Not everybody's guilty. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, but yeah. doesn't it depend on the personality? Because you can, might see somebody, you've got a preconceived <coughs> idea of what this person looks like and then they come in front of you. I'm not saying you, Manny, but some people might think, well, hold on a minute, this person looks like a victim or uh, not a victim, a... Uh, um, uh, a perpetrator, a perpetrator. Yeah, yeah. and so maybe they might say right okay they're black they're trouble mm -hmm. let's give them let's give them a few couple of um, years sentence because uh, obviously in um, across the board there is racism but also in Gloucester because there is a small population of black people and majority white they have a preconceived idea on on how culture is and um, in my experience, you know, I haven't been to prison, but uh, what I'm saying is my experience. <laughs> I've known of people that has been incarcerated for the wrong reasons, and maybe it's because they thought they that the they places. deserved it. Yeah. No, it can we're gonna, happen, yeah. we're gonna absolutely get into that. I have to call time on that mm. one. Because we, we got a job, don't we? We, we, got, we got to do this. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Questions. Val, Val wants to join us as the co host. You know, this <laughs> <laughs> I thought before, we were warming up. Before I do move, I have to ask my co host with the most this. Um, when do you, f when, what, what, at what point did you feel like you had a role to play within the community? Did you, did it's, you like. It's really it, strange. I, th I, th I think that part was chosen for me all right um how can i um to in the description was i suppose being in this hall um the all nations community center this hall's been here since the early 70s mm. yeah and it was built by um 
Caribbean community, people from the Rimrush, they put their own money together and they built this hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been standing here a long time. My dad was actually one um, of the people in the community that helped build it. Wow. So a lot of our weekends were spent here. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of parties, family gatherings, and like Tracy said, everybody in the community knew each other. Mm -hmm. So I suppose in a sense, I was forced to be a part of a community long before I knew yeah. what was actually happening. Yeah. Um, and I grew up in Barton and Treadworth, which to me, I'm really proud of because it is so multicultural there. Nothing's changed. It's even, well, it has changed. It's more diverse. It's more multicultural. Um, got more Eastern European people. Yeah, there more now. Eastern European yeah, people, yeah. Um, Polish, Ukraine. Um, it's amazing the change that's happened. Um, over the last 20 years, it's, 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 you know, it's been quite fast, this pace. And yeah, so I, I'm, I'm proud that I've grown up in a very diverse, multicultural society. So I've, I've kind of, I've been in touch with the community and a part of the community, it naturally, Story. you know, I haven't had to walk into this role. It's, it's, it's just, I like it's that. natural. I like, I like the fact that it's a calling. It's not something you're forced to do. It's mm. almost like an, an, an instinctive thing. Do you see what I mean? That to feel like, oh, you're not doing it just to please people here and there. It's almost like, no, this is a this is like a duty that that, yeah, this is, that is like a generational thing that's kind of seeped into you over time that you feel like, okay, this is something to just kind of just pass in the baton and carrying on with. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really keen on touching on that later. But um, over to you. How was your arrival? received once you recognised that you, you wanted to play a part in your community? How do you think your arri arrival was received? Can I ask you, Manny, how you yeah. felt? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. like I said, I've never really felt that people are discriminating against me. I've always felt that I'm part of the community and um, when I became a magistrate, everyone was keen. I, I, maybe I, there were only, there was Carol Francis who was a magistrate already and I was one of the other three Asian people. And they, they were fine. The BBC, very keen, because they're all in the 80s and 90s, they're all getting in, trying to get more Asian and African people involved. And uh, yeah, so. Do you feel your presence um, on BBC Radio Gloucestershire has made um, a huge difference in, in your arrival, how you're received in the community? Yeah, definitely. Because I, I, Funny thing was, I got to know more about the Asian community <laughs> as a result of doing the BBC radio show. Yeah. So I had to go out there and I learned a lot about... In those days, it seemed to me like uh, the Barton Street area, there were a lot of African-Caribbean people were separate and the Asian people were separate. There were the Muslim community separate and the Hindu community were separate. And we used to then... if We, we started organising a few ev events with the BBC, or I did, and then we used to get all the communities together more of the Asian communities, the African Caribbeans were uh, still doing their own thing mm -hmm. yeah. until we had started having those events in the park. I don't know whether you remember in, in, on a, in, the, in the summer we used to get, every, yeah. you know, there was. Yeah, with the fair, the Gloucester with the fair, fair, the fair festival. And, and so, and but even then we had an Asian event and there was an African Caribbean event. We didn't really mix it all together. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I, I, I just didn't feel out of it, I, I, but I learned a lot about other communities. Do you feel we are um, mixing together more now? I think though? so, definitely, because, yeah. I, because I, I remember there was, there was a difference between uh, Asian and African Caribbean people, but now you've got the Eastern European. It seems like it's Eastern Europeans are separate now, mm. and the African Caribbean and Asian are together. <laughs> And sometimes no, I, I, I kind of feel we're, we're all together more now. I suppose because I even work on Barton Street, I work in a barber shop, and it's quite diverse. So one of the barbers is of Eastern European background, one is of African background, and one is um, of Arabic background. So we are a diverse salon, and I'm Caribbean. So I don't know. I feel everybody is more, more sort of in touch, more, more together. There are 22 hairdressers in Barton Street. You sure? Yeah. I, I think can't, it's I can't, I can't, I can't. I think there's more. I think there's more. 22. 
Do you think it's more than 22? Yeah, I think really? there's around wow. 26 barber shops. <laughs> I know, Just barber shops, you know, hair salons. Yeah. I mean, the total figure, you, it's 30 plus. It's a great tour. You go there because I go to the Asian guy, you know, uh, Millen's. But there are a lot of people who come into the barber shop just to talk. Yeah. They're not having their hair cut yeah. or anything. They're That's just right. sitting it's there. It's about socially, just yeah. everybody it's, just want to just chill different. out and it's different at, different have attitudes. conversation. Yeah. You know? yeah. But again, it seems to be separate, Sorry. though, doesn't it? Do you not think? No, I don't think it's separate. I think everybody are, are moving together more. I think the, the, the community is more, yeah, more, more embraced. I think yeah. everybody are more, more together. Mm -hmm. But that's just my opinion. Everybody's yeah. opinion is going to be different, and that's what this is about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We all have our own individual feelings about community. Tracy, how do you feel that your arrival was received? Well, part of it was, like Manny and probably and Val and yourself said, I've probably always been part of the community, but and I've had I've stepped back because, as I said, I was focused on work, and. My uh, arrival, as I said, when I put myself forward to be part of the community recently, it was that I, I, felt, I felt very comfortable. People were, you know, I didn't feel like I had... Um, uh, I, I, when I don't put feel my, like you'd been away, because no, even though yes. you hadn't lived yes. in Gloucestershire for yeah, people the were whole very, duration. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was very welcoming. People would be like, oh, I know your face. Where do, where do I know you from? And it would be like, oh, OK. And so I, have, I didn't feel you know, that putting myself forward would be something that would be negative or people be going like, well, why is she doing that? It would be, it was just like, it's a natural thing for me to do. And so, as I said, it's very early in the stage. I'm still learning what I need to do or what's, what's part of it. But now I'm just like, if I can do this, let me see what else is what needed, else needed what else I can do to support. So you're enjoying this journey? That, yes, that I am you're enjoying in. the journey. Um, the other thing is, obviously, I've been part of the RS Collective with you and Val in the past, just do, do, doing whatever little bits here and there. But now I can just say, I need to, you know, I need to be part of this. I need to, need to help. Thank you. Thank you. Val, how do you feel? Um, yeah, I, I feel that I'm, um, well, there's, because we're in Gloucester, it's a very small community compared to if you went to Birmingham or Bristol or Wolverhampton or somewhere like that. So we're almost like a, a close knit family. It doesn't matter whether what culture you come from. Um, um, there, obviously, there are different languages and different cultures and you've got to understand each other. But the coming together, it's like we kind of have some sort of un mentioned unity in the in the sense of how we behave around each other um i had uh, a shop on barton street and um like manny was saying in the the barber side people come in for a chat so you you hardly get anything done because people are just popping in yeah, and saying oh Everything i'm just coming just to say hi yeah. how you doing and so we're there so culture wise we kind of had that kind of understanding but yet um we still didn't understand the, well i didn't understand a lot of the culture um my my parents have mixed heritage anyway we've got a bit of asian here a bit of white there and so on like whatever so we we're a mixed bag um but in 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 michelle's question of your arrival mm. You're not only are you breaking, you're, you're, you're literally breaking in the norm. So if this is the norm, which was the sickle cell and the awareness of raising sickle cell, and if that wasn't being done, in you come like, how dare all of you? Like, this is what I'm going to do. And you kind of, and this is what I'm going to do. And you've landed and you've arrived. And from, I know that we've spoken in the past, and in terms of the work that you've been doing, I'm not sure that everyone's going to be happy with that. So how was that received when you came out the gate to be like, this is what I think we should be talking about, well, this is important? Can I just go back a little bit? Mm. Um, during my school years, um, I almost came out of school without any education. Mm. And I didn't really know why until I actually went in to do, um, start my cert ed teaching training and found out along my journey that I'm dyslexic. Now, because my mum, she's my role model, God rest her soul, but she's, she was my role model. She said, if you, can't, uh, if you can't do something in one way, 
approach it in a different way, but don't give up. So this journey being now is that if, if I, for the sickle cell thing, awareness, um, somebody said, oh, it can't be done, or it's too much. I said, well, hold on a minute. Have you tried all avenues? So because of the way I've been brought up or my beliefs, I can say, right, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be done. It just matter how, how. And I, so I suppose that's my arrival. It's knowing that you can approach anything, but it depends on how you approach it. How was it received? How it was received is that, hmm, she know too much. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know what I mean. Um, what I mean? How, yeah. And I guess that's, that's the main, that's the thing which Michelle's asking, like, with all of that and, mm. you know, bless your mum. And I think that is something that my mum will tell me and mm. that's something that I will tell my own kids. Do you see what I mean? But then they go out the gate and they do that, the way they're received, mm. I suppose, is very different. So she knows too much. And was that one of, like, various things that you heard over time? Or, like, was there other things? like? Well, it can't be done. Or, you know, um, where you get... How do you... How can you do this? Or how are you going to approach this? I goes, well, I don't know. I'll have to go back and let you know. Mm. So it's just really sitting down in the process and thinking, well, hold on a minute, how am I going to approach this? Mm. It, I don't know. It's just part of an in thing. It's just I don't feel that there should be any failure. I think that if you look at things on, on an open, in an open way, then there's ways of, of achieving things if you want it. So I suppose that's it. I, I don't know, I just do it. Are we I think we don't always think, I personally don't always think it's black and white thing. No, it's not. It's a different mm. I just, just do it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then you... Yeah. But there's the one thing of doing, but are we all in agreement that there is some form of resistance at some point? Oh, I do haven't you, experienced it. You haven't experienced resistance personally. Uh, I have in, within my own yeah. in stuff that I've tried to put into place. I've been met with resistance. But that may not times. be because of your colour, though, or your race. But arguable, it, in some cases it has been. Yeah. Um, and in some cases it's because purely because people are not used to change or what change means. Mm. It's almost like we're used to kind of seeing what the norm of this could be, but we're not willing to go there because we haven't been there before. Mm. So I think it plays different facets, but I think in you, in, in the panel, and I'm including you, Michelle, and being part of this, is that at some point you are doing individual things to enforce forms of change and you might be met with resistance. Maybe, for the most part, it could be towards... It could be leaning on your, the, the, the colour of your skin, or it could be leaning on change. You've talked to you know, the magistrate stuff. I doubt that, for the most part, that just comes to trying to get people to understand things yeah. and understand different cultures and just have different cultures. Yeah, you know what I mean? If you're talking about resistance in that way, mm. then um, it, it just depends on the... On, um, for, I can talk from my, my mm. own experience is that there were doors that were closing in the sense of if I wanted to, to like for instance, um, computers was, I'm not that old, but computers were just starting to come in. Mm -hmm. And I went to college and I said, oh, I would like to be a, a computer tech person. And that was all, it was more male orientated. Good and they said, well, these are, for, these are for men. I said, well, why is it for a man? I want to do it. Yeah. And so they said, oh, fill in these forms. And I filled in the forms and all that. And they looked at it and said, well, hold on one minute. Went away, come back and said, well, you know, I think we should, you should try another course. Mm. This is way before my cert ed. But I didn't realise it's because I was dyslexic mm. why I was, uh, I was getting that, that kind of barrier up. But there are obstacles in, in everyday life. And um, yes, I have had them, but they, I didn't let them phase me mm. because um, why, you know, if I did, then I wouldn't be the person. But saying that and listening to you, uh, a majority of the black boys especially would have met a lot more ops, um, uh, kind of um, barriers. barriers. I think with, with there's an opinion involved, then that could happen. But mm. when you've got like entry qualifications, like you were saying for that course, then it's different because either you, you know, it's like us for various courses. If you haven't got the basic knowledge in maths and English and a bit of IT, you're not going to be able to complete the course. Mm. It doesn't matter what your background mm. is, what your knowledge is, if you can't do that entry test. Yeah, so, but the so, assumption. But on other cases, when you've got like mm. court cases mm. 
and there's an opinion involved of a magistrate or in a job situation where there's an opinion involved, then I can see people might discriminate against somebody mm. because they have a, an image in their mind that the person is of that type, you know. Mm. Well, I would also say that's why apprenticeships are so important because not every child is academic. No. Yeah? yeah. A, a, a lot of young people are more practical, you know, they learn by what they see and actually working on the job, you know. For me, that's how I um, went oh, into really, hairdressing yeah. um, through an apprenticeship. I could have gone to college and done it that way, but I wouldn't have equally have had the experience of working, you know, with the general public and learning that job um, creatively. You know, within a salon environment, a real environment, you know. Um, also, Yemi, what I wanted to say, um, when you were saying about um, that y you felt you were sometimes met with, um, you weren't always received and you felt that maybe, maybe not every door opened for you. Mm. Um, do you feel that you were supported um, by your family? Were you encouraged? By your family? It depends on whether I wanted to tell them. Yeah. If yeah. I'm honest. Mm. Um, why wouldn't you tell them? Why wouldn't I tell them? Yeah. Um, good question. I think in, in some cases, I know my mum would ride for me. Like if I tell her she's out the gate chasing people out, she'll be like, how dare you? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, how dare you what though? I would, like, how either, you? either how dare you kind of not include my child in X, Y, and Z, or yeah, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Do you see what I mean? So I think mm -hmm. she would definitely do that. But I think as I grew older, I just kind of leaned more on trying to figure stuff out myself. Yeah. And I think that's something that was innately something I wanted to do. I don't want mum to be, always be there to try to help me out. I think, let me try to, let me try to make sense of this, especially if she can't make sense of it herself. What am I missing here? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I think there was something there that was quite important. And especially now, it reads to a point where um, I done an interview last week, and I'm just like, okay, people consider I consider myself to be a writer. I'm a writer. I write plays. I write poetry. Um, I write stuff for radio. This is what I do. Whereas, forward facing, if I say to someone that I'm, if I say predominant to maybe, if I say I write poems, and people be like, oh, you do spoken words, and I think a spoken word is leaned more towards. Um, black people as opposed to it being seen as just writing poems. It seems like, no, you just don't write poems. You, you do performance poetry and spoken word. This is your expertise. So if I present someone with a poem, for example, it might not be taken as serious. It might not be seen as like, oh, you're not in the, in the lines of like a Shakespeare or a Wordsworth or all these different white, white poets or contemporary white poets because your poetry is different because you're a black man. And, um, it still stands now to a certain degree. So I think slowly but surely some of those um, assumptions are changing along the way as we're kind of seeing the rise of how that is changing. But there's still resistance that's still being met, at least from what I remember. I've been writing and performing now for 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of seen how the trajectory of this has changed over time. Do you see what I mean? And how people um, are more open to, right. to work that is creatively different and, right and yeah. how something and like, deep yeah and, and how something yeah. like a genre of of poetry is looked and frowned upon but it's li it's the living heartbeat of what poetry is now for the youth is like performance is being out there not that many young people are as keen to kind of go into books but this is an entry point for them to start accessing poetry by seeing it on youtube or seeing it on adverts or, or what have you and then the gate i want to find out more let's go into a book. Mm -hmm. So it's been taken a lot more mm -hmm. serious as a serious. different avenue, as a way in. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think early doors of resistance has been met, but I've independently wanted to find mechanisms of my own to find a way to power And you've them. been determined to... Just to go yeah, through. Yeah, to continue. But I can't say the same for other young people, other young adults, because if you're, there's only so much resistance you're met with before you're just like, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I just can't engage. I was more curious to find out why. Why? Some yeah. young people, some black, predominantly black boys, they're not so curious. They're just like, you know what? I've tried three times already. I'm not going to be embarrassed a fourth. That's it. I'm done. And that is the, that's that tipping point. And I think that's where my purpose kind of serves to be like, no, try a fourth. Yeah. Try a fifth. Mm. 
Or fear four or six. And, and, see, yeah. and see where that takes you, just what I mean. Yeah. But yeah. Definitely. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question now. Um, why are you doing what you do? And why is it of importance to you? And I'm going to bring that question to you, Tracy. I mean, within your career path, what you're doing now, why are you working within cybersecurity? Well, it's funny, actually. I got into cybersecurity almost by accident. I've been in sales for m most of my career. Most of my career, I've been. Um, I, when I started in sales, I was um, in the waste industry, so I was the one who was selling to um, businesses and providing, you know, tell, recommending what size of containers they needed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that they could go ahead and have the right level of service that they needed, and obviously doing that for a competitive price. Also talking to them about hazardous waste and or that kind of, um, you know, how to dispose of their waste correctly within the legislative guidelines. So. Um, I was made redundant from that job and went and was looking for another job. And it was like, okay, what am I going to do now? So I was looking around and there was an ad for a job in a cyber, on, you know, on the, um, with the recruiter for cybersecurity. It didn't say cybersecurity. And it was like, this job is right around the corner. Because normally in, in my job in the waste industry, I was traveling and, you know, I was away a lot. And I was like, this one, you know, it's right, the, the office is like 10 minutes from where I live. It was too good to be true. It was yes. too good to be true. I was yeah. like, okay, this can't yeah, yeah. be real. Mm -hmm. So I applied, I got the job and it was, and I, I fell in love with it. And so I had been in with it then. And I fell in love with cybersecurity because it's actually helping people. And you're helping people so that they don't get scammed or they don't have people, um, you know, hackers trying to get into get their personal details and, and, you know, and take advantage of them. Um, because they're not only just looking for your financial details, but you know they can be manipulating you in all kinds of different ways. You're talking yeah. about people who, who you know um, who are manipulated on social media as well, you know, on, you know, with their Facebook profiles, etc. And so I'm working with the company now, and what we do is that we work with the companies that so that they're, they're co the employees they are able to be more cyber aware in their own personal lives yeah. as well as at work so that they're less likely to be. And help unhacked. friends, family and to absolutely. understand the dangers out there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got Facebook or, you know, make sure that you've locked down your security settings because it's so easy for people to get information from you and use it for ways that you can't even think that they can do. I mean, there are, it, it, it's really scary what people can do out there and what they're trying to do. And, how, and it's not so just individuals you've got, um, you know, this is, it's a business. You know, this, this is, is what, real. This is yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And when you're going in anywhere, you know, don't go onto public Wi-Fi. You know, these are things that people, you know, know anyway. But it's surprising how many people still log on. On you know, you go in into Starbucks. So oh, let me log on to their Wi-Fi. Mm. Even on the train. Yeah. 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 Log on oh. if you want to, but just don't go on to your banking or any of those yes. kind yeah. of yeah. apps. Personal. Do you mind explaining? for folks that might just go to like a Starbucks or just to, um, or just to explain it to me, like the, the, the local Costa or the Starbucks. And then it, and then it's like, oh, join the Wi-Fi. Because chances are, I might just want to join the Wi-Fi. Well, if you're joining the Wi-Fi, it's not a problem. Yeah. But just make sure that you're not going onto these apps where people can, you know, because pe there are people there that can, um, use the Wi-Fi. They've, they've got these different um, tools that they can they can skim your phone, for want of a better description. They can go on, see what you're doing, and, you know, get your information. So just be very, very careful and very aware of what you're doing. Mm. I mean, if you're on games, that's one thing. If you're on the news, that's fine. You're reading the news. But don't go on your banking. That is the one thing. Do your banking on secure Wi-Fi. That's real valuable information. Mate. I'd like to ask you the same question, um, Manny. Why are you doing what you're doing? Do you know? Um, what do you, and why is it important to you what you do? I've never thought about it like that at all. I just do it. Yeah. My, fa my fa like, you know, we were talking about parents. My father was a treasurer in a church. So we always had people around our house and we went to people's houses. So any job to do with working, working with people, that's always been sort of what I've enjoyed. So, and education has been quite important with the Asian cultures, you, you really, they, all, the parents always want you to get a qualification so that you can get a good job. And um, so I think 
I've always been wanting to educate people. I was in the air cadets when I was from the age of 13. And I became a corporal very quickly, and I was teaching other kids how to do this and do that. And I think it's, education is the answer for everything in the sense that, uh, I mean, people like Socrates and Buddha were saying this thousands of years ago, um, that if you can educate people, they'll understand each other much better. And if you have a better understanding of each other, you'll be able to tolerate each other and, and recognize the differences that we have and yet still get on with your own life. We've all got our own problem. There's education changes people's attitudes and if we can change people's attitudes, we can change their behavior. Yeah. And so that I do all the things that I do, I just do them and I, I'm always thinking about other people. So can I just push you a little bit and just and ask you again, via Michelle, now that you, you're here now, mm. Why do you do what you do? Like, why is that important? Because no, I feel like, I, I know you're saying that, you've yeah. never thought of it. Yeah. But I feel like there's something in a 10 year old that traveled from India and is here. There's something subconscious in which the calling that we spoke on earlier that we don't really put too much emphasis on, but those things really drive us going forward. I think forward. Maybe, maybe it is, it could have been in the past as you're growing up and people say to you, oh no, you can't do that maybe, or you should. You know, it only so. When I wanted to join the air cadet, when I joined the air cadets, I wanted to be a pilot, mm. and I couldn't be a pilot. They, I, I just didn't have enough qualifications at that time. Mm. Although I did later on, but then I became diabetic, so I couldn't join the air force and become a pilot. But I wanted to do, to prove, I suppose, to myself that I could do things, mm. and uh, so maybe that's what it is. And, and when when I was learning thing. to be a teacher, lecturer, yeah. I didn't used to question people. One day in a counselling course, um, when I was getting feedback from the teacher, he said, do you know what, you don't challenge people enough. And ever since then, this is the 80s now, I challenge everything. <laughs> Anybody and everyone, I challenge them. <laughs> why do they, like you're saying, yeah. why do they? But is it to, to prove to myself that I can do things? I'm not sure. But that's, not a, that's a beautiful place to be, I think. Yeah. Because I think there, there's, there's less... We don't put enough emphasis to be like, I'm doing this because I want to be better at what I'm doing. Listen, I like, when I arrived in England, I spoke very little English. Yeah. Well, I, I, now I, I, I write poems. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I tore my play. Mm. There's, a, there's, the a huge, there's a huge, there's <laughs> a, exactly, there's a huge trajectory. And I think very little emphasis of being like, I'm doing this because I, I didn't think I could. Mm. And it sounds a bit self-righteous, but it's not. Like at one point, this isn't something that you was actually capable of doing, or if you did, it was very, very small. Now you're, you're a lecturer. Yeah. And I think there's nothing in you to take back from that form of achievement that this is, this is, this is what you're doing and this is why it's important to you. I think the so accent I mean. is quite important because I, I realized that when I was growing up, people used to tell me, Mickey, I have an Indian accent. Mm. And you go to an Indian restaurant to win, uh, you know, I, I used to go clubbing quite a lot, four, four nights a week at one time. Uh, <laughs> you? What are you I did, yeah. yeah. We <laughs> want to know what about that, Manny. What was this? And you're, all the night Forget clubs. the magistrates, Manny. Let's talk about the rainbow, Manny. What are you talking uh, about? R&B <laughs> and... Glow sticks and everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't even know Herbie Hancock, on. James Brown, all oh. these people were like, they're my things. And I do, I do Ciroc and Salsa now, even now. <laughs> And, um, but ac ac I think joining the Air Cadets made me speak the way I do. Mm -hmm. I realized that what happens is, in the British culture, sense of humor is quite important. And if you can get, sort of, get jokes in and insulting somebody in a sort of joking way mm -hmm. gets you in. And I learned that fairly early on. And people, because I speak the way I, people automatically thought I was well educated, even though I didn't have very many qualifications at the beginning. And I, and I realized accent is very, very important because if you want to be part of Gloucester, you've got to talk like the Gloucester people. <laughs> if you want to be part of like Cheltenham, you've got to talk like the Cheltenham, Cheltenham people. And uh, so, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned language because yeah. the, the only thing that wasn't necessarily bringing it to the forefront was my language. I'm Yoruba, so that's, that's my community. But that was like the last thing I'm trying to latch onto in trying to assimilate within yeah. a predominantly white landscape, right? 
now I am confident in, 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 well, I can't speak it to the T, but I'm confident in just being, embracing every part of it. Yeah. And I think there's something there around the almost kind of pushing the language and culture to one side. And now a fully fledged me that is wearing, you know, I'm wearing my culture. Do you see what I mean? It's part of me. Whereas at one point, I almost felt like I couldn't necessarily do that. So in, 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 in respect to what you're saying now, in terms of these different accents and different, it's in adapting. I think for me, it was very important that cool, all fair and well, that I can go into these different hats. But I should feel very proud in, in me being here and being very present. So thank you for sharing that. It's very, very important. OK, and Val, and now on to you, um, to my last question. Why are you doing what you do? And why um, is this of importance to you, Val? Um, I suppose it would have to go back to my, my younger days um, when there was only three channels, BBC One, ITV and BBC Two. Yeah. And on um, BBC Two, I think it was, was Maya Angelou, the uh, poet, and she was talking about her life. She wrote five autobiographies. And what... Um, so, basically, when she was speaking, interviewed on, on, on um, the TV, she was telling about her journey and how she became... Um, a, um, a selective mute at eight years of age when she was um, abused by a family member. And I found that the way she actually rose from that and became the, the famous poet, author, um, she was playing with Porgy and Bess in theatres and things like that. She inspired me and I thought, oh my gosh, if she can do something like this and after all that trauma, that trauma that she went through, I don't know why I shouldn't do that. And I thought I need to know about a bit more about her. And um, that's when I started to read a lot more because I went to WH Smith, picked up a Theosaurus book, a dictionary and a, note, and a writing pad and a couple of pencils and pens. And I forced myself to read this book. It took me months to read one little book but I just needed to know more about her. And that's, that's what inspired me to kind of go forward. It's then, and also my niece, um, she would always complain that why am I always buying her a book? Why not a toy, a doll or something? And I said, no, it's important to, to be educated. And my children, they would never get any toys or anything from me. They would get something educational. I said, you need to have something. Um, that would educate your mind. I said, you don't need to be like me. So I was kind of a disciplinarian at the time. So um, that inspired me to kind of do more for, the, for myself as well, for young people. If I see someone and I go, oh yeah, what are you doing today? What are your aims and objectives? You know, maybe you should do such and such. And they look at me to say, I don't want to do that. I want to go out and play. But that's what kind of um, inspired me to go forward. And then um, um, looking at education and everything else and going back a little bit, I always wanted to be a surgeon because my mum suffered with um, mental health and um, I thought it was all to do with the brain. That's what the doctor was saying and everything else. And I thought, oh, if I became a brain surgeon, maybe I could fix it. So I went, started to go into that. And then I thought, well, something stopped me and obviously I knew I know what it is now is dyslexic dyslexia but um, at that time I felt that um, that was the the role that I wanted to play but then I enjoyed music dance and all things that's creative I thought oh, I could do this so it was just opening a kind of a whole world to me and um, as I journeyed in through my life and becoming more of a mature person I hope um, with a few little relapses in my childhood you know um yeah so it was just to inspire others it was um but also through that journey i was learning myself it was um anything i was showing or being taught i could actually introduce that to the to others as well whether you're young old and i it just gives makes me alive to be to look at things interesting and seeing how best I can tackle it. You mentioned dyslexia a few times now. Mm. So do you feel that is a bit of a hindrance? No. In fact, when I actually volunteered for on the radio station, 
and um, we, at that time it was cutting and splicing, it wasn't digital. And I only left there because I felt my writing would let me down. And so I had to go, go in a different direction. And um, it's only when I had the assessment done after I, I applied for the teacher's training and um, all my work was coming back with red lines and highlight and uh, you must do this. And I'm thinking, what the heck is this woman talking about? Or this teacher? I'm do I can't see it. And it's only when um, there were a few um, visitors that came to talk about learning, barriers to learning and so on. And I said, oh, I can relate to this. I can relate that I'm dyslexic. So off I went, it was um, at the college on Bronswick Road. I went to the library and uh, then they referred me to Cheltenham to have a, a test done. I thought, my gosh, it was like having a, a, a graduation certificate. I could throw the things up in the air. I said, oh my gosh, I'm dyslexic. Now I know that there's not... Um, it's not intelligent. Yeah, it's, and it's not yeah it was, wrong, it was it? just yeah. the way my brain was um, wired up. I, because can even can when I, ask, I was... How old were you when, that, when you got that uh, um, diagnosis? Oh, when I died the diagnosis, I was about 30, in my 30s. Really? Yeah. So I had, all that time, you yeah, didn't know? Yeah, I, I ran my 35. own business. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was running my own business, doing um, work, raising awareness for different things, and I worked my way around. If I couldn't tackle it one way, I'd say, right, I can't do it that way. I'll go round another way. Or I'll ring up somebody or talk to somebody. I'll say, can you do such and such? I'm not able to do this. Yeah. Not like that. I would say, you know, you're, you've got that gift. I said, can you come on board and work with me? And that's how I worked it out. Yeah. So how did you find out? That you I was teaching. I'd been teaching for years. Um, I was in the middle of um, updating my teaching certificate. And my lecturer just kept picking up all sorts of different things that was wrong with my, um, my essays. And it was just really weird. Um, so when she said that she wanted to put me through for the assessment and it was going to take four hours, I felt quite upset. Mm. Oh, I... um, to the point where I was just emotional throughout, you know, the initial first part of the assessment. I couldn't stop crying. My nose was running. I mean, it was, I just looked a mess, you know. Um, but I was relieved at the end that actually... You know, this is okay. You know, it's not something to be about, embarrassed about. You know, um, many many children go through school, and we did. We went through school, not not even being picked up that there was a barrier to our learning. Yeah. But that, that's, Abram, that's what I was just about to say. That's what's really bad. That you you went through the entire school system, primary school, secondary Everything. school, and nobody nobody picked nobody up. Nobody picked yeah. up because they are set, the assumption is that. You know, uh, for, for me, I almost left school without any qualifications. I started to fill in the forms, tick the boxes to say which subjects I wanted to use, I wanted to do. And this woman, Pat, um, one of the teachers towering over me, and she's crossing them out and saying, you can't do this. You... I said, what do you mean I can't do these subjects? She says, I said, are you telling me I'm leaving school without any qualifications? She said, that's right. Of course, I don't think so. So I went home, I said, mum, they're not letting me do any exams. And she says, oh, them know what them I do. That's in the sense that in Jamaica, the understanding is if a teacher says that you're not able to do something, you better believe that you can't because they really know what they're doing. And she thought it was the same type of thing in England. And I was so upset and I, she saw me crying and everything. She said, right, I'm gonna go up there. I literally sat in this small cubby hole of an office with, I won't mention her name, God rest her soul, but she smoked like a chimney. I call her the, a serpent because she had an extended cigarette holder <laughs> and a thing, and she would be, you would have to bat your way through into the thing. Uh, but what always resonate with me is that she said, Mrs. Sims, I could guarantee your daughter will come to nothing. She's incapable of learning anything. You'll be wasting your money. That's terrible. And I thought, oh, but did your mum believe her, Val? No, she said, um, she said, she said, Val, do you want to take this in Patwa? She said, I'm not going to do it in Patwa, but she said, Val, do you want to take this? I said, yes, mummy. And she said, I'd rather waste my money 
than to know that my daughter is going to hate me for the rest of her life. She goes, oh, well, you're going to... So they had to... Six months it took them to get me up to a level to prepare me for exams. I passed every single one of them, but the struggle and the, the lack of education that I had to help me was already... The damage already done. So if I hadn't been as stubborn as I am, as you already know, I'm quite... Um, forward um, approach, um, then, yeah, if I didn't have that kind of stubbornness to say, look, I want to do this, I don't, I would have stayed the same as I was. Just listening to everybody um, and thinking about importance and where we place importance, mm. um, that is not so cut and dry, especially when it pertains to education and especially education mm. when it pertains to, to children of colour, um, that, that there are intricacies in there where things go undiagnosed, and as a result, that child is just deemed as being disruptive when really that child probably doesn't know how to read what mm. has been put on the table for them to read, right? And I think I'm thinking about the things that are important, that I found important for myself this year in terms of purpose, in terms of Michelle's question. Mm. Like, why is this important for you? And I think we've, we've gone through a year of COVID, we've lost our elders, in losing some of our elders, we've lost their stories. And some of them stories can't be archived. I felt like that was a big loss for me because there are some people that, that I would have loved to just sat down and just press record and just let them talk about their life. And I don't know if that opportunity, that opportunity unless if people have had moments of grabbing pieces of information, mm. we've lost so many people, some of our senior citizens, and we're not going to get them stories. We've, we, we've witnessed a murder on, on, our, on, our, oh on, our, gosh, on our very yeah. screens. And to which a knee was held on a, on a neck of a black man for, for, for eight minutes, 46 seconds. And the, we've seen marches, we've seen people protesting, um, witness COVID on the effect of students, specifically students of color and how algorithms are predicting their grades and some of them from low and impoverished communities, how it affects them. When I look at all of these things happening over time, and I'm just that, of course, there's an importance for me here. Let me tell you about the algorithm, me. though, because I think it was a mistake not to follow the algorithm. Mm. Because as a lecturer, the, the, the whole idea of the algorithm was that um, they would look at what's happened in the school before and what the lecturer themselves or the teachers, uh, what their students have been getting in the past. Mm. So all of that was going to be brought in. That was the algorithm included. But they, in the end, went with the opinions of the teacher which wasn't right. Mm. That wasn't the right thing to do because I could then give somebody a grade because I like them. The algorithm would have been exactly. better. The algorithm would have been better because I was all for it. And that's what I said at the school. But the thing at the college, mm. in the end, they went for my opinion. So I had 120 students. I had to predict what their grades were it's based insane. on their, on their uh, mocks and assessments. It's insane. But I could also have had my own opinion. I, so without even knowing, if I fancied Val, I could have said, well, actually, I think I'll give her grade four. Yay. <laughs> and then we just witness, and then we see and that, how... That's what happened in the end. Right. And then, and then so people the are schools, affected. Some of the schools had got bad grades in the past. All yeah. of a sudden, I've got higher grades. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's why the algorithm was important. Yeah, people but, didn't understand it. No, but the problem is that when my daughter, when she did her marks, it was almost like that really put a fire under her, mm. and her results, her actual results, were better. So, I mean, that's why it doesn't work for every child. Yeah. No, no. But that's because we didn't use the algorithm. No, that, but... If we had to use the algorithm... No, but I'm talking, she, did, she, was, she didn't... Fact, that didn't factor into it, but what I'm saying is that just... Be, it, it, it's, it's an unknown, and I understand that you have to use something in order to predict grades, but I'm using her as an example and just saying that when... If you were using her baseline for the algorithms that you were going to use for the children, you know, that couldn't take the exams this year, it would have it, that would have made it more difficult because she w was down and then up, if you know what I mean. I know. Uh, the thing is, and, um, you, and you're going to have lots of children who do yeah. who perform that way mm. as well. And and just to kind of move this on, I think in all of these cases, especially in the one that you just highlighted, um, Tracy and Manny, I think where bias plays a part, yeah, people will lose. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And in 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 and in my experience, for the most part it tends to be children of colour that will lose. And I think... I'm well, speaking. And not necessarily just children of colour, but ch children in schools where they are, you know, where, where they've got yeah. less opportunity, where they're... Yeah. 
poorer. Poorer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and but and again, tools in terms of and just following off from your point, though it's broader, say children of colour, and the the the, the from the portrayals of what that might look like in terms Absolutely. of lower impoverished country, like low impoverished communities, what have you, there will be a lens that will be leaning more. Yeah. What would you say to your eight-year-old, nine-year-old self? In, in looking back now, if you could, if you could speak to your younger self, knowing what you know now, the ages that you're at now. As an eight-year-old, I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, but if you could, well, oh, Tracy, like you're looking, yeah, looking at yourself. Yeah, no. Yeah. What would that? What, would, what would you say? What would that conversation be like? It would just be to tell myself, you know what, you're better than you think you are, because the, I think that was the thing growing up. You were always, you, my parents always said, you know what, you've always got to be. Uh, do uh, try harder and because you are black and you're a woman you have to do ha work harder mm -hmm. you're going to have to be more effective you know people are always going to look at you second um, that's just part of life and so that was something that I did understand and that was something that obviously I've been instilled in my own child but looking back on it now going back to my eight-year-old self, I would have said, yes, that's something, but you've got to be more confident that you have the skills, you have the knowledge, you've got something special mm. to talk about, you've got something to share with people, mm. you, you know, that you, you're, you're not dumb, you know what you you know, you can do this, you can do anything you set your mind to. Because, you know, I didn't realise, you know, you, I've got, when I think back over my life, I had a lot of resilience, I've done a lot of stuff, but um, when you're going through it, you don't, think that you're, you know, you just seem you like, just you, you, yeah, you don't realize that, that everybody else is doing, them. everybody yeah. else feels exactly the same, same. way, yeah. Yeah. you know, you just, and so that's what I would, that's the main thing, just have the confidence to know that your gut instinct of what you want to do, you're absolutely 100% right, and, and make, and the other thing I would tell, tell my eight-year-old self is make yourself happy, because a lot of the time I compromised mm. to, make other people happy and uh, you know and so at my and often at my own expense and the thing is that you've got to look at and sometimes that's good sometimes that's bad but you've always got to look and make you you've got to live with yourself so my thing would going forward would have been to don't compromise mm. um as much as you did mm. because i compromised too much mm. Mm. wow thank you yeah mine uh, my eight-year-old self i would then um say be more expressive be able to just say how you're feeling mm -hmm. and not lock that away to say well no one's gonna, not going to understand what i'm talking about um that my eight-year-old self would would have been a very shy eight-year-old mm -hmm. and not knowing what to what to say to an adult so i would say to my eight-year-old self to say look just sit to your parents down and say, this is how I'm feeling and this is what I want to do. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Manny? Yes, I'm, I'm, I grew up in India. I was, I was eight in India. And we always had this problem of being a Christian. There were Hindus, there were Sikhs and Muslims. There was always that discrimination between uh, people in India. But as, as a Christian, I relied everything. I just re relied on God. Mm. So anything that I was going to do from early on, we used to go to Sunday school, church. I don't think I'd change anything about my life. I, I've enjoyed every bit of it, and I think that that was more important. And to leave everything to God, I used to say, right. But what would you, now what would you say to your eight-year-old self? Don't after, change after anything. After Just live as you as you did. I wouldn't. I wouldn't ask myself to change. You wouldn't ask yourself to change. No. I, enjoyed it as it is. Mm. I, enjoy, it, all I remember is just laugh and enjoyment. Mm. I don't remember. My father's ex-army, and he, you know, he just sort of said, I, I still remember when I was do, when, in between my GCSEs, uh, well, O-levels in those days and A-levels, and I said, well, look, I'll go and do some work. And I, my father said, do you know what? You're going to be working for the rest of your life. Don't worry about work. Mm -hmm. Just get on with doing the education. I'm not saying that I would want my eight-year-old self to change, mm -hmm. but I would like to have had more into that, that eight-year-old's mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. That's what I would be saying to yeah. my eight-year-old self. Yeah, because you've become confident, but over mm -hmm. time, yeah. you know, that's part of life and that's part of growing up. But if you had 
no, if I could have developed that at a younger age, it mm. would have been better yeah. for me. Um, awesome. Oh, it's just, it's, it's just watching you just kind of go through your own head to kind of think about your eight-year-old self and what you'd say is amazing. And I think if there's one thing I've understood from the panel so far is that you're so forward-facing in terms of just kind of seeing things through that I wonder whether there's time for reflection as much. And, and I guess on the final question is around downtime. What about you? Like, what happens on a Sunday night? Like, what is, what's going on? Like, on an on a, on a, on a average kind of evening when there isn't no work? You can't be all work all the time, man. No. Come on. Like, no. we're not all that busy. No. Like, yeah, I have to no. shout out about that situation. Like, work, not, yeah, uh, listen, all sorts of work. I, I was just about to say. It's not always that, is listen, it? Listen. Yeah. You, you Val's not saying nothing, you know? No, 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 because when you finish work, then you finish your job, then you got to go ahead and, like, cook dinner, then you cook dinner, then you got to change sheets, uh -huh. towels, what, laundry and stuff. You sit down, you make two phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> the TV's watching you. <laughs> You're actually <laughs> on the phone. But wait, um, it's a serious question. But no, it's serious. like, but it's almost like, when do you, when's that downtime for you? Like, when, when, when is it not the, when is it not the, the manager or the worker, the, the partner, the, the, the parent, you know, the friend? When is it, when is it you? And, and what is that like? It, for the folks that know the work you do in Gloucestershire, right? For the folks that watch this, that know of you. They might be asking the same thing. Like, when do you take a break, man? We always see you all the time. When do you have some time for yourself? What's, what do you do? But if you enjoy yourself all the time, it doesn't matter. I, I don't feel I need to have that downtime. I enjoy almost everything I do, I enjoy. Mm. If I'm watching Coronation Street. I'm not saying that, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying like it's like you don't enjoy it. Yeah. But I still think I there's elements of self mm. that's separate to the work one does. I, I think, I don't know if they I, I don't know if they're... everything like that. I don't think of things... It would be interesting to know how you I mean, kind of... Yeah. How it's got to a point that they're both interconnected. Because I think, for me personally, I try not to keep it as connected. I try to keep it as separate as I can, to know that this is my time for me, and it's not necessarily relating to these facets that are part of me, that make me up. The downtime... It's, for me, it's not, I don't know about that word, downtime. Yeah. Mm. For the full reason that when I get home, kick off my shoes, I say, oh, I, I need, it. so you might equate this as downtime. So kick off my shoes, I look and see whether um, the house is okay and all that stuff, and I turn up, switch on the TV. Or the downtime is when I'm driving, I suppose would be driving, turn, switching on to Channel 4. Mm. I like plays. Mm -hmm music, debates. So I suppose that is, but that's still part of my, my kind of um, life. So when I clo go into the house and close the door, I will sit down like, <laughs> like um, Tracy said. By the time I sit down in this comfortable chair, the TV is watching me. Mm. You know, it's that type of thing. So I suppose speaking to my friends or family on the, on the mobile, um, having a loudspeaker on and having to say, look, you know, but I'm the, like an ag agony art. Mm. I can chat about everything mm. or say, all right, don't worry about this, whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's my downtime. Mm. But either way, I'm relaxed. I can mm. just relax and then, yeah, I suppose I do yoga. Subconscious yoga, because years of yeah, <laughs> and the reason why I say subconscious yoga. Because I watched it on the telly. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's a different no, kind of yoga. Somebody else do yoga on the no. telly. No, yeah, what it I is, can see myself doing yeah. that. <laughs> It no, feels no, no. peaceful. Ah, that's it's really where, interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's where you... No, you don't have to be active in yoga. It's oh, okay. meditation. That's it's relaxing nice. oneself from head down to toe. So it's not down times down dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, you're so, he's such a comedian. But, what you know, basically, when you look at... When you kind of take a... You breathe in. The thing is... Uh, I, I just, I, I must be odd, I, I must be different from everyone else, because I don't ever feel... Come on, Manny, it's Chirac. It's Chirac. I know, because I, I, do, I do so many different things, like I do a bit of Chirac when that was available, uh, because obviously during the pandemic we can't go dancing or anything, a mm. bit of salsa, 
bit of music. R and B. My favorite is R and B. I want to see Rave. Yeah, and Val wants to learn to do a bit of salsa. You said I wanted salsa. You said Chiroc. It'd be better. Much easier. Guess what he said to me? He says I've got to make ensure that I take instruct. What's it? What did you say? <laughs> he said, I've got, to obey. I've got to obey a man before I can learn to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the chief because of it. Because, <laughs> as you know, you probably, all those who do dancing, if yeah. you do with the man couples, leads. the man leads. Oh, yeah, the man yeah, yeah, leads. Yeah, yeah. You've got to allow a man to you lead. Can't, lead, can't, yeah, can't, but he said obey. And I yes. thought, well, was he obey. boxing? <laughs> I thought it was language, obviously. But that you know, yes. this is the obey. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Obey, I don't do that. The problem is, if you start... Obey, you wow. Get you in when, a headlock. You, when you do about? the moves, is... if you start leading yeah. and you don't listen to what the guy is trying to teach you, <laughs> then obviously it would be a conflict. Yeah, you? but it's different gender nowadays. Look at the um, Strictly Come Dancing. They've got um, two males, uh, two females dancing together. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. But, when, but when you have, you've got to lead. allow your partner to lead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. one person's got to lead. Because I dance as well sometimes. Yeah, I'm yeah, a solo. Yeah, yeah. I am a bit resistant, you know, the guy's trying to push you one. Yeah, way, yeah, yeah exactly. We're not going that way. We're getting right. No, we're getting no. left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it can get a bit, yeah. you know, like it's a bit tough one. This is it. I brought up my two daughters like, sing, as a single parent, like, two daughters, mm. they're teenagers now, 19 and 20. There were some stressful times, but even then, went through it. I was surprised I didn't have a heart attack when they were good. But Wait, do you feel the dancing helped you? Mm. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Mu and music. Mm. Mm. M music is quite important. I guess what's interesting is that, like, it's not something at the forefront of our minds. It's almost as like yeah. it's, it's innately like, mm -hmm. oh, we just do this, but we're not necessarily prioritizing this mm -hmm. as like this is actual downtime dancing. This is accepting this is, life. Yeah, it's almost like you're kind of convoluting it with with everything else. We're really no, it's not yeah. <laughs> sitting or letting the TV watch you is actually that time that you're taking to yourself, no matter how many minutes it is. But because just life is what it is. It just seems like it's part of the process when really, nah, it's 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 um it's not. Michelle, any downtimes for you or well, anything related? So downtime for me, I'm sorry, it's it's dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What I sort of dancing do you do? Um, salsa, tango, oh, right. zumba. Um, Wicked. Any kind of dancing in the kitchen while you're cooking, yeah. you know, Wicked. swinging around, dance like nobody's watching. Yeah. Yeah. We ought to no, do that's a few, the best form. Yeah. We ought to do a quick demonstration. <laughs> um, Salsa steps. Yeah, I suppose. Sadly, because uh, of uh, uh, COVID, Michelle will be leading, yeah. by the way. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Because Michelle of COVID, <laughs> we don't know when yeah. we're going to yeah. return to this, dancing. Yeah. Yeah. I like guess um, it's that, especially. But it's been a, it's been a long time not dancing, and yeah, I, I am missing that, me, you know, because yeah. I think because life is so busy, and I didn't get to dance every week. I look forward to those couple of hours where I could just forget about everything and just yeah. focus on my dance steps and learn that new routine, and it was just just so nice. I'm gonna pop round to you, you then, then, Michelle. But honestly, going, going music down, and dancing, it just heals the soul. Yeah. Yeah. I, I deliberately don't, in my mind, I don't say to myself, I must take some downtime. Yeah, exactly. I just do it. No, yeah. I, think, I think that's true, because the thing is, like, um, I'll, I'll go down to the gym and I'll just be like, uh, you know, I'll go down and just go on whatever mm. machine or whatever and just walk or, you know, and have my music in because it's too cold to walk <laughs> or, or run outside. It's, it's that feel but it's just that thing time. that's released yeah. when you're doing yeah, something like that that you, that you enjoy. Yeah. Like but I think it's just the time to just yeah. say, this is me, yeah. there's nobody else around it, this is my focus and, you know, you just... You don't think about anything else. All yeah. the thing, all the stress of work, and you know, getting all the thing, you know, meeting all these deadlines and priorities and everything. It, you know, you don't think about anything like that. You don't worry about, you know, getting, having dinner ready or yeah. you know, having mm. <laughs> all the other things. You can just empty your mind. I was at work last huh? week, and, like I was with, um, doing some writing, and uh, and um, a colleague, she was like, "Oh, I'm just going for a walk." 15 minutes. I was like, what? what? <laughs> so I'm just going to go for a walk. Sunny outside. I'm just going to take myself and go for a walk. And I'm like, I don't ever think I've made that conscious decision while I'm doing some work, whether I'm writing or not, to just say, all right, let me get up and go for a walk up the road, taking a bit of air, let me come back and just crack on. I've never actually made that decision. And I've I guess done that. I have, I have to do it, that, it's particularly now since lockdown. That's yeah, what I do. Yeah, lockdown kind of gave the opportunity because yeah, I'm saying take the hour out in a day, like take the hour, 
go yeah. for it. And I guess in listening to how we're just all talking, it's as if we can make decisions to get in, cook, mm -hmm. get in, um, make sure everything is in order. But the last thing we're saying is seven o'clock downtime. Like, but there's, I often put times to things that I want to do, but I don't tend to put time to just, and this is just for me, I don't tend to put time to say, okay, this is, and I guess I do that in the gym because that's my time to listen to this new album that I've been wait, wanting to listen to. And my phone is on and I make no friends in the gym purposely because I just <laughs> want to be on my own, mm. let me train. I don't have to talk to and no one. And in your zone with your music. And let me just zone yeah, to my music. You're in your zone. Yeah, but myself. that's nice downtime. Right? Yeah. I haven't got that. Yeah. Um, I haven't got that. Thank you. I think this has been awesome. I definitely, okay. I definitely just got to understand a lot more regarding some of the history and the context. And I'm, I'm very thankful personally from, from someone that I'm considering myself like an outsider, but I'm still linked within a community and I, and I relate to what I've heard over time that we've been talking. Um, Michelle, yeah, I don't know I've, if I've enjoyed any... every, every minute of it. I, you know, it, it, yeah, we've learned more about each other. We've learned a little bit about ourselves as well. And our processes. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's, yeah, it's been a journey. Mm -hmm. Thank all, you. All, all that we're missing is just the glow stick Manny. Like, the... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just... Yeah, I want to get up and do my thing, you know? <laughs> like a sex machine man, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you, thank you for joining us and, <laughs> and thank you for just engaging in our conversation. Thank um, you. And yeah, until next time. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Good.